welcome back to another video this really popped when i saw it that to me is a monster increase again this book got hot this book is ready to go higher so let's jump right into it we are back today with another statue review from diamond select toys without further ado let's get into the review Bang! What is up YouTube? This is Lawrence over at Mighty Comics and Collectibles and thank you guys for joining me for another video here on the channel. Today of course we have another episode of You Guys Ask, I Answer. I put it out all over my social media platforms, IG, YouTube, any questions you guys want I'm answering here today. But before we get started in the video, like always, I remind you guys if you're not a current sub of the channel, do yourself a favor, hit that sub button. You guys are definitely missing out if you're not subbed to the channel. Do me a quick favor, hit that like button because it really does help the channel out. If you're not following me on all my social platforms like Twitter, Instagram, do me a favor, click the links below. With that said, let's get into these questions. We're going to start with a question from Spine Ticks Pressing. Lawrence, can you discuss the value gap between CGC and CBCS? Are the new changes to the CBCS case in lieu of the CGC scandal showing evidence of narrowing the gap? So let me first acknowledge there is a price difference between CGC slabs and of course CBCS slabs in most books. I will acknowledge that right off the bat. However, I do think it's too soon to see if CBCS has taken market share away from CGC at any level, maybe a little bit, could be a lot. I know when CGC announced their scandals, both of them, a lot of people stopped sending their books in. You could tell by how fast people were getting their books back. However, now it's kind of shifted back over to people taking a long time to get their books back in the mail. Like even silver and golden age books worth a ton of money are taking about a month to two months for people to see them starting to ship out. And I think that has to do with CGC lowering the price on some of their tiers. I've said it before, I think CGC really did themselves a disservice, but really with that last price increase, I think it was a little bit too much. I know I had a big rant over it, but I think it's going to be a little little bit of time before we can see if CBCS can take some market share away from CGC. With that said, I do love CBCS's new labels and I absolutely love their slab. I think it is totally tamper proof from what I can see. CGC has yet to acknowledge that there is an issue with their slab and I've heard from multiple sources that saying they will not change their slab as well. So going forward, I think it's going to be a little bit of a wait and see. I'm kind of hoping that CBCS can take some market share away because that only benefits collectors. Next up, let's take a question from my boy Izzyverse NYC. What is your opinion regarding the variant and incentive market? To me, you guys know I don't collect exclusives. I don't collect variant covers, stuff like that. I don't even collect moderns to say that. With that said, I do think if you are an exclusive collector or a variant collector, you have to be very careful in what you're buying. I personally will not spend this kind of money on some of the stuff that I see that they're selling for. All these books have no history behind them. They're just cool looking covers on books that are reprinted. With that said, down the line, when they go ahead and try to sell some of these books or the collection of these books, they're going to have a tremendously hard time just even getting their money back. I think a lot of these books down the line, they're worth absolutely nothing. So I'd rather from a collector standpoint, buy books that I know have history towards them. Now with that said, are these books going to hurt the hobby down the line? I don't think so. I think a lot of the collectors who collect these books, they may be affected and I wish they collected more things that were more well loved by other people in the community. And they also think that they would find themselves in a better financial situation as well. But it is what it is. People like these variant covers. They like these exclusives and they're willing to pay up for them right now in this market. Here's a great question from Derek Rice 5203. As an older collector myself, what are your plans for your collection as you get older or when you're not around? My sons are 11 and 4 and they are both already arguing over my Daredevil 1 LOL. So this is a great question I think all collectors have to ask themselves at some point in their life. Again, if you're in your teens or in your 20s, you're probably not thinking about this right now. But if you're in your late 30s, possibly early to mid 40s or even 50s, you have to start thinking about what you're going to do with your collection when it's time to go. For for me, yes, I do have stepsons who I will leave a lot of this stuff to, but I will say this, I'm not going to leave them everything that I own. I would like to sell a big portion of my collection. Uh, if I can piece it out myself and sell them individually before I go, I will do that. 
well in advance of when I think I'm going to pass. With that said, I like to leave them with all the major keys like my AF-15, my ASM run, my Hulk one, my Batman one, and my Tech 31 if I can. If I cannot, guys, I plan on selling them individually just to get some money in the bank because for me, it's easier to sell these books rather than pass them on. I know a few of them, like I stated earlier, I want to definitely pass along because they do have meaning uh, for my children and for myself. Here's a question from Mountain Rock 70. If you had to keep only one comic and it had to be a gold key or Harvey and you had to keep the price under a dollar, I'm going to say this, there are probably no books out there that I want to own that are worth under a dollar, no matter what they are. If they're Harvey, Gold Key, Marvel, DC, I probably am not collecting them. I will say that. But for you, you might want to start doing some digging because I can't really answer this question. Hope that helps. How about a question from a channel member, Robert Davis. How bad do you think CGC will be conned with verified signatures being rolled out? Keep in mind, the FBI states that a majority of the collectible autographs are forgeries. Well, let me start off by saying we all know why CGC is doing this, right? They definitely have lost business from the two scandals that were going on. So they had to do something. So they ended up buying a company in order to be able to verify signatures now. And it was not that long ago, they came out and said, we are not looking to verify signatures. It is too much of a risky proposition to do that. And of course, now being the fact that everything is about money and how much money they're making, they decided to flip flop and say, let's start verifying signatures. To me, this is nothing more than a money grab. So if you're a big signature whore, and yes, I said it how I said it. If you like signatures on books, and maybe you want your signatures verified instead of having a CGC person come with you in order to get a signature actually witnessed, this may be the route to go. But they're also covering their asses, in my opinion. There are a lot of signatures out there that are fakes. We heard about a couple of scandals already on Keeper Thoreau's channel. Make sure you guys are subscribed to him because he always does a fantastic job. He's talked about it before, how there are some other signatures that were put on books, possibly Javon Jordan, that are not his completely. So this is also a way of them covering their tracks, in my opinion. I'm not a really a verified signature guy. However, I do have a couple of things, like a Jack Kirby sig on a raw book that, hey, I have no reason to send that book in to get slabs, so why would I do it? But some people like to do that. So my thoughts are, I think it's a money grab and they're covering their ass. So up next, the biggest question on everybody's mind right now, from second best Bob 28 one of the best handles I've ever heard of. I'm guessing you'll all have heard by now that a giant size X-Men number one, 9.9, has just been graded. Any thoughts on that? So yes, I have a lot of thoughts. And the only reason I didn't really put a separate video out on this topic is because everyone and their mother has already done it. Everybody has put their two cents in already. And I'm just going to say this. All 9.9 .9 grades before this book was graded and now beyond are nothing but scams in my opinion. Of course, why now all of a sudden are we going to see more 9.9s come out is because CGC needs to make money. All the books that were graded before at 9.8, you figure a lot of people are going to send those books in right now for a pre-screen for a 9.9. .9. What does it do? It devalues the 9.8 and it also devalues current 9.9s. We also have to consider who owns this book. It's owned by Metropolis Comics, right? It's not some Joe Schmo out there in the community. It's a big dealer out there in our hobby. With that said, would you or me have gotten this book graded at a 9.9? I'm going to say I have no idea. I do believe a lot more 9.9s are on the way and it is nothing more than a money grab by CGC. If you're a grade whore and you like 9.8s and you like 9.9s, do yourself a favor, submit your books, but keep in mind you're also devaluing all other comics in our hobby. Here's a question from my buddy James Moss 3424. What is your opinion on X-Men 97 and how the value of X-Men Adventures 1 will be after this series performs? So let me tell you right off the bat that X-Men 97 so far has been absolutely great. I've only been through a couple of episodes so far, but if you're into 1990s nostalgia, this series is definitely for you. How it affects comic books, I don't really think it does in my opinion. I just think it's a great callback to when we were kids. And that's a lot of what this hobby is for a majority of the collectors out there. So with that said, I don't think it really affects any books out there. But if you're a fan of the X-Men and you like cartoons and it brings you back to a simpler time in your life, I'm all for it. Here's a phenomenal question from Tiger Tiger 2 who always asks some of the best questions out there. Thoughts on a pedigree comic and what's the value they hold for a non-pedigree book? So to me, it really depends on the pedigree. Um, 
I'm not a huge collector of pedigree comics because I don't really want to overspend for a book. And a lot of the times, depending on the pedigree itself, it can go for a lot more than the standard comic usually would. So with that said, I'm not a huge fan of buying them, but I know they can go for more money. With that said, does that mean you should go out and spend more money to buy one of these books? It really depends on your collecting preference. For me, I wouldn't do it, but for you, maybe that's something that's important for one collector to hold on to this book his entire life and then all of a sudden be sold off to a different collector. For me, I don't see the point in that. Again, if it was my collection and I had a, a pedigree book that I collected since I was a kid off the rack, hey, maybe that would be something cool, but I just don't see it being important enough to go ahead and spend extra money on a book. So this is the best question I've ever been asked on one of these videos from David Clark, VU3DW. What condiments do you like on a really good hot dog? So let me say this, I don't eat hot dogs, okay? I haven't had a hot dog in about 20 years because they're no good for you. I try my best to be as healthy as I can, even though lately I've been drinking a lot. With that said, if I had to eat a hot dog and I've had them before when I was a kid, I'm strictly probably a ketchup and maybe some sauerkraut and that's about it. There's an awesome question by PDH Bricks. What's your favorite comic cover of all times? So if you watch my channel religiously, you know it's a copy of Amazing Spider-Man number 39. That awesome first John Romita artwork on the Amazing Spider-Man title. I absolutely love that one. I think it's one of his best covers that has ever been done. But I have some close seconds and thirds. Uh, ASM 121, ASM number 50, Detective Comics number 31. All books that I currently own. So to me, if I had to pick a few, those would be it. You guys know I'm a big Spidey and Batman guy, so you knew it was going to fall with one of those two. So now we're going to end this video on probably something that I'm actually going through right now and I know a lot of collectors are as well. From good buddy Wobbly's comic stash, how do you combat collector fatigue? And I think this is a great question and something that definitely needs to be addressed. I know I addressed it in a, a previous video but I think the way to do it is to kind of just slow down, right? We can't just keep buying over and over and over. Maybe we have to kind of prioritize of the things that we do want to keep in our collection or prioritize the things that we want to collect right now instead of collecting everything out there now i don't know if you guys out there just collect comics or you collect other things i myself i collect comics i collect uh certain toys i collect sneakers so what i'm doing right now is just slowing down i stopped really buying comic books i don't buy shoes that often only shoes that i think maybe i can try to flip and make money on or keep in my personal collection if i absolutely love them but uh some of the toy line stuff i really started stop collecting as well i was collecting retro amazing spider-man figures i stopped that uh, my master's unit universe origins run it's really at the tail end anyway so that was ending but i really stopped buying comics unless i can get a really good deal i would say to all the collectors out there if you're collecting and you're really really tired and you don't know if you want to do it anymore take a break go to cons still go to shows still go to your lcs but only buy something if it's an absolute steal of a deal Put that in your mind and I think you cannot go wrong. Eventually, you'll go three or four months or maybe even six months to a year and say, wow, I really haven't bought anything and I really want to get back into it. At least that's my thought and how I'm thinking right now. But I'm in a little bit of a different situation. I really have all the books that I want to own in my collection. So I don't know if that's for every collector who doesn't have everything they want. So that's to each his own. But just know, don't go out and feel like you have to keep spending money. Take a break, go on a vacation, get away from comics for a little bit or wherever it is that you collect and just take a break. That's it for this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. There were some awesome questions that were asked for this iteration of this video. A lot of great questions about the future, about collector fatigue, about certain books. This was really, really fun and eye-opening. It shows me that a lot of collectors out there are probably thinking the exact same things that I'm thinking. And I gotta be honest, that's really comforting right now where I am in this hobby. I'm always here to answer all you guys' questions. So if you have them, do me a favor, drop them in the comments down below. I will try to answer them on a future video. With that said, do not forget, I'm always looking to buy collections. I have a couple of partners of mine who are also looking to spend some cash. If you have some good books, do me a favor, my email in the description of every video. With that said, this is Lawrence over at Mighty Commons and Collectibles saying thank you for watching and I'll talk to you guys soon.